In the annals of history, there are figures who rise above the rest, leaving a mark on their nation and the world. Skanderbeg was one such legendary leader, often referred to as the Dragon of Albania. Skanderbeg's journey was characterized by bravery, resilience, and an unwavering commitment to his people. His rise from a hostage of the Ottoman Empire to the valiant defender of Albanian independence has left a mark on history and cemented his name in legend. He was truly a captivating figure and led a 25 year long anti-Ottoman rebellion. He was a warrior, driven by an unyielding spirit to resist Ottoman overlordship. This is his story. Skanderbeg was born in 1405 in the Kruj region of Albania, which was then under the rule of the powerful Ottoman Empire. His father was an Albanian feudal lord who served as a vassal to the Ottomans. At an early age, Skanderbeg was sent to the Ottoman court as a hostage to ensure his father's loyalty. This was due to the known practice known as Devshirme, which is Ottoman Turkish for blood tax. This was the Ottoman practice of forcibly recruiting soldiers and bureaucrats from among the children of their Balkan Christian subjects. Skanderbeg was sent as a hostage to the Ottoman court in Adrianople in Turkey in 1415, and again in 1423. Apparently, Skanderbeg's three older brothers were slowly poisoned when they staunchly refused to convert to Islam. During his captivity, Skanderbeg was exposed to the Ottoman culture and way of life. He received an education in various disciplines, including languages, literature, and Islamic teachings. Moreover, Skanderbeg learned about the military strategies and tactics employed by the Ottomans, providing him with invaluable knowledge that would later become instrumental in his fight for Albania's independence. Despite his prolonged stay in the Ottoman court, Skanderbeg never forgot his Albanian roots. His unwavering allegiance to his homeland and his identity as an Albanian noble remained steadfast. This sense of loyalty and patriotism would become a driving force in his eventual rebellion against the Ottomans. However, his martial upbringing and military education earned him the position as a military commander in the Ottoman army. Skanderbeg displayed remarkable skill leadership and tactical acumen, catching the attention of the Ottoman Sultan, Murad II. The young Skanderbeg was described as tall and slender, with a prominent chest, wide shoulders, long neck, and a high forehead. He had black hair, fiery eyes, and a powerful voice. Accounts of his legendary strength state that his sword swing could cleave an animal or man in two. Martin Barlicius, a contemporary and chief biographer of Skanderbeg, provides one of the earliest descriptions of him. After a Tartar who was envious of the young Skanderbeg's growing reputation at the Ottoman court, challenged him to a duel to the death. The Albanian stripped to his waist and warned his boastful contender not to violate the rules of honor. During their match, Skanderbeg struck off his opponent's head with a swing of his sword and held the severed trophy before Murad, thereby winning the Sultan's favour. As a result of this, Skanderbeg would fight in many battles for the Sultan, and even gained the title of Saifi, which is a professional cavalryman which were deployed by the Ottoman Empire. During Skanderbeg's early life in the year 1432, where he would have been in his twenties, a series of conflicts between Albanian rebels and the Ottoman Empire would ensue, being labelled as the Albanian Revolt. During this time, Skanderbeg did nothing, remaining loyal to the Sultan. Skanderbeg would rise quickly through the ranks. The Ottoman Sultan himself honoured him by bestowing upon him the name Iksandr, comparing him favourably to the Macedonian conqueror Alexander the Great, conveying his greatness. Skanderbeg's success in various campaigns earned him accolades and recognition from Sultan Murad II. As a testament to his loyalty and military achievements, Skanderbeg was appointed as the governor of the Sanjak, 
but administrative diversion of Dibra, which today is Albania and Macedonia. His role within the Ottoman hierarchy appeared to be on an upward trajectory. Despite his rising prominence within the Ottoman Empire, Skanderbeg's heart remained tethered to his homeland Albania. As he held a high position in the Ottoman administration, he became increasingly aware of the oppressive nature of the empire's rule over his people. Witnessing the suffering of his fellow Albanians and the Ottoman expansionist ambitions, Skanderbeg began to question his allegiance to the empire that held his homeland in chains. In the year 1443, the Ottomans faced mounting challenges from external forces, particularly from the Hungarian and Serbian armies. The Sultan called upon Skanderbeg and other commanders to defend the Empire's territorial interests at the Battle of Nish. The Battle of Nish was fought between the Crusaders, led by John Hayadi, a leading Hungarian military and political figure, and Jurad Brankovic, the Serbian despot and one of Serbia's last medieval rulers. On the other side were the Ottomans, and Skanderbeg was in command of a contingent of his own men. As the Battle of Nis unfolded, Skanderbeg was confronted with a moment of reckoning. Faced with the prospect of fighting against his fellow Albanians in service of the Ottomans, he made the decision to desert the Ottoman ranks and return to Albania. Skanderbeg realised that his true allegiance lay with his people and their struggle for freedom. Skanderbeg quit the field along with 300 other Albanians serving in the Ottoman army. He immediately led his men to Kruy, a town in north central Albania, where he arrived on the 28th of November. He would use a forged letter from Sultan Murad and gave it to the governor of Kruy, and then he became the lord of the city that very day. Skanderbeg had returned to his native land and had taken back Kruy Castle after tricking the Turkish governor into turning it over to him. He then declared war on his former masters. Skanderbeg's banner displayed a two-headed eagle, an image significant to his own family, but also one that had been used by the Roman Empire. It became a well-established emblem in the Balkans symbolising the refusal of the Albanian people to submit to Islam. Skanderbeg abandoned Islam and reverted to Christianity, and ordered others who had embraced Islam or were Muslim settlers to convert to Christianity, or face death. In March of the year 1444, Skanderbeg convened at the historic assembly of Laser. The assembly took place in the town and it was here that Skanderbeg presented his vision of a united Albania. In a powerful and impassioned speech, he emphasised the significance of their shared identity and the common goal of breaking free from Ottoman rule. Skanderbeg's charisma and persuasive abilities won over the hearts and minds of the Albanian noble families, who pledged their support to the cause of independence. During the assembly of Lays, the League was formally established, the League of Lays was a defensive military alliance, and its members vowed to fight together against the Ottoman Empire. Skanderbeg was unanimously elected as the leader of the League, solidifying his position as the focal point of Albanian resistance. Sultan Murad II, realising the threat, sent one of his most experienced captains, Ali Pasha, to crush the new state with a force of 40,000 men. Skanderbeg expected a reaction, so he moved with 15,000 of his own men to defeat Ali Pasha's army. The two armies met in the plain of Torviol, where they camped opposite of each other. The following day on the 29th of June, Ali came out of his camp and saw that Skanderbeg had positioned his forces at the bottom of the hill. Expecting a quick victory, Ali ordered all of his forces down the hill to attack and defeat Skanderbeg's army. Skanderbeg had expected such a manoeuvre and prepared his own stratagem. Once the opposing forces were engaged and the necessary positioning was achieved, Skanderbeg ordered his forces hidden in the forests behind the Ottoman army to strike their rear. The result was devastating for the Ottomans and nearly every Turkish soldier was put to the sword. 
about 8,000 Ottomans were killed, and 2,000 were captured. Skanderbeg's first victory echoed across Europe, because this was one of the first few times that an Ottoman army was defeated in a pitched battle on European soil. Another force was sent one year later, but was again defeated by Skanderbeg at Mokra in 1445, which was the second major Albanian victory over the Ottomans. After establishing diplomatic relations with major European powers, Murad II resumed his campaign to crush all remaining resistance in the Balkans. As Murad prepared his forces to launch a campaign against Hunyadi, who was in that year proclaimed the Regent of Hungary, he sent a force of 15,000 cavalry into Albania. The Turkish plan was to fight a war of attrition, pillaging the land and inflicting terror on the population, while avoiding a pitched battle. The Ottomans would split their forces, and attacked with 5,000 men. When Skanderbeg learned that the Ottoman army was split, he attacked the Ottoman camp with 5,000 men. The camp was set in disorder as the Albanians pierced through, turning it into a slaughterhouse. 5,000 Ottoman soldiers fell, and 300 were made prisoners. The whole camp and its supplies fell into Skanderbeg's hands. Skanderbeg had proven himself to be an exceptional commander, defeating the Ottomans with less men consistently, and fighting alongside his men in the thick of the fighting. The description of this warrior at this time is as follows. He had black hair, fiery eyes, and a powerful voice. So warlike was his nature, that he truly needed to wage battle from time to time. He killed more than 2,000 Turks with his own hands. He was a master of all weapons, swift and ingenious, a general with a quick and certain gaze, audacious and resolute, naturally possessed of a fiery temper. Anger would go to his head quickly and set his eyes ablaze, but he would dominate his anger, biting his lips until they bled. His courage in battle stemmed from this struggle over his evil passions. All in all, his customs were pure, his manner noble and elevated. Over the next two decades, Skanderbeg proved to be an unparalleled military strategist and leader. He orchestrated a series of brilliant military campaigns against the Ottoman forces, employing guerrilla warfare tactics and demonstrating remarkable agility on the battlefield. His intimate knowledge of Ottoman tactics acquired during his captivity played a crucial role in his success. Skanderbeg's stronghold was in the mountainous region of Kruy, where he established an impregnable fortress that acted as the heart of the resistance. The fortress not only provided a strategic advantage, but also symbolised the indomitable spirit of the Albanian people. However, in 1448, Skanderbeg had lost the castle of Svetigrad when an Ottoman army led by the Sultan himself marched into Skanderbeg's dominion and captured the key Albanian fortress. Skanderbeg was at war with Venice at the time, and he attempted to relieve the garrison by engaging in skirmishes with the Ottoman army, but to no avail. After the loss of Svetigrad, the League of Lays experienced low morale. The morale of the Albanians sank after the losses in the previous years. When the Turks began marching towards Kruy in 1450, Skanderbeg himself claimed that he had received a vision of Saint George, handing him a flaming sword to destroy the enemies of the true religion. Before the siege began, Skanderbeg exited Kruy with 8,000 men. Sultan Murad reached the stronghold on the 14th of May with approximately a hundred thousand of his best soldiers, culminating in the siege of Kruy. Murad set his army to cast ten cannons, one of which could fire rocks weighing 400 pounds, and another 200 pounds. Despite the firepower, the Turkish firing positions were at a disadvantage. This is due to the stronghold being part of the mountain on which it was built. The cannons could fire two to three times a day, and were not accurate. 
Murad fired on the stronghold for four days until a breach was finally made. The Sultan believed that he had the advantage and ordered his troops through the walls. The garrison managed to push the assault back, thus gaining time to repair the walls. Skanderbeg would ride out at dusk and raided the Turkish encampment, killing several men, capturing and destroying Turkish supplies, but he almost lost his own life. When Skanderbeg returned to his men, his shield was so battered that it had lost its shape. This reflects again that the Albanian war leader was a man of action, ready to fight and die for his cause, and the people loved him. When the second assault began, the Turks tried to break through the gate with their lances. After heavy casualties, the attackers retreated, and Murad held for the next two days a council of all his generals. The Turkish attacks had made no headway, and the Ottoman army had lost many. Whereas Skandenbeg's force had lost 1,000 men thus far, on the 26th of October, Murad would lift the siege due to the arriving winter. The siege cost 20,000 Ottoman casualties and over 1,000 Albanian casualties. That winter, Sultan Murad fell ill and died when he had returned to Turkey. He was succeeded by his son, Mehmet II. According to legend, one night during the siege, Skanderbeg sent out a herd of goats with a candle on each of the goat's horns. The encamped Turks believed it to be an Albanian attack, and made a movement against the herd. When the Turks advanced far enough, Skanderbeg launched an attack against the force, destroying it. After the siege was lifted, Skanderbeg commemorated his victory by designing a helmet with the head of a goat on it as a reference to his tactics and victory from that night. Although Skanderbeg had achieved success in resisting Murad II himself, harvests were unproductive and famine was widespread. Alfonso V, the King of Aragon and King of Naples, was a powerful and faithful supporter of Skanderbeg, whom he decided to take under his protection as a vassal in 1451. Shortly after the latter had scorned his victory against Murad II, Skanderbeg was appointed as Captain General of the King of Aragon, in which Skanderbeg would become Alfonso's military vassal in exchange for military aid. Although Sultan Murad had died, his son Mehmet was even more hungry for power and would push on the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. In 1453, Mehmet II did the unthinkable, and captured Constantinople, which deeply troubled the Christian states of Europe. Mehmet by then called the Conqueror, turned his attention to finally defeating the Kingdom of Hungary and crossing into Italy. The Siege of Berat, the first real test between the armies of the new Sultan and Skanderbeg, ended up in an Ottoman victory. Skanderbeg besieged the town's castle for months, causing the demoralised Ottoman officer in charge of the castle to promise his surrender. At that point, Skanderbeg relaxed his grip, split his forces, and departed the siege. It was a costly error. The Ottomans saw this moment as an opportunity for attack, and sent a large cavalry force. The Ottomans caught the Albanian cavalry by surprise, while they were resting on the banks of the Osum River, and almost all the 5,000 Albanian cavalry laying siege to Berat were killed. After the loss at Berat, Skanderbeg was betrayed by some of his most trusted officers. Skanderbeg had been the leader of the Albanians for over a decade at this point, and had seen many victories over the Ottomans. However, Skanderbeg's resources were worn out after a decade of continuous war. By the end of May 1457, a large Ottoman army was seen approaching Albania. Skanderbeg sent a letter to Pope Calixtus, informing him of the Ottoman arrival and the dire need for military aid. The Pope responded with a promise to send a fleet to Albania, even though the enemy was on land, but it did not arrive. 
Skanderbeg was thus left to fight the oncoming Ottoman army alone. In total, Ottoman forces numbered between 50,000 and 80,000 men. Armies of this size were usually commanded by the Sultan himself, so rumours spread that Mehmet was leading the campaign. In contrast, Skanderbeg had between 8,000 and 10,000 men to stand in opposition. Rumours began to spread that Skanderbeg had fled as he was unable to confront the Ottomans and his men had betrayed him. However, he was actually coming up with a plan with some of his most trusted men. He climbed a high hill and on its peak spied on the Ottoman camp and saw where they were resting. He descended with his chosen band to eliminate any watching guards, but once saw Skanderbeg and fled into the camp, yelling that Skanderbeg had arrived. In order to maintain the surprise, Skanderbeg ordered his men to get ready for battle. The Albanians launched a surprise attack and charged into the Turkish camp. The Ottomans were caught by surprise and despite their large numbers, were terrified by the fury of the Albanian assault, thinking they were attacking in larger numbers than they actually had. Seeing that they were surrounded, the Ottoman force began to panic and fled. Skanderbeg's actions again convey he was a man of action and a warrior through and through. By this time, Skanderbeg had many names attributed to him. He was called the Champion of Christ, the Lord of Albania, and the Dragon of Albania. In the year 1461, Skanderbeg made a three-year armistance with the Ottomans, as he waged a military expedition to Italy. As his ally King Alfonso had died, his successor King Ferdinand was not as able as his father, and now it was Skanderbeg's turn to help King Ferdinand regain and maintain his kingdom. Skanderbeg defeated the Italian forces of Orsini and Taranto, and secured King Ferdinand's throne. King Ferdinand was grateful to Skanderbeg for this intervention for the rest of his life. At Skanderbeg's death, he rewarded his descendants with the castle of Trani. After securing Naples, Skanderbeg returned home after being informed of the Ottoman movements. Mehmet had sent three armies to crush Skanderbeg, but he defeated them all. This forced Sultan Mehmet II to agree to a 10-year armistice. Skanderbeg did not want peace, but Tunash Thopia, an Albanian nobleman and a great friend to Skanderbeg was sick of war and wished for peace. Tanush himself went to Tivoli to explain to the Pope why Skanderbeg had opted for peace with Mehmet II. He pointed out that Skanderbeg would be ready to go back to war should the Pope ask for it. In November of 1463, Pope Pius II tried to organise a new crusade against the Ottomans. The Pope invited all Christian nobility to join, and the Venetians immediately answered the appeal. So did Skandenberg, who on the 27th of November in 1463 declared war on the Ottomans. In 1466, Sultan Mehmet II personally led an army of 30,000 into Albania and laid the second siege of Krui, as his father had attempted 16 years earlier. After several months of siege, destructions and killings all over the country, Mehmet II, like his father, saw that seizing Krui was impossible for him to accomplish by force of arms, so he left the siege to return to Istanbul. However, he left the force of 30,000 men to maintain the siege by building a castle in central Albania. Skanderbeg spent the following winter of 1466 and 67 in Italy, of which several weeks were spent in Rome, trying to persuade the Pope to give him money to fund his fighting against the Ottomans. Skanderbeg famously wrote in a letter, I am a friend of virtue and not fortune conveying how he did not care much for money, but only for his country and the fight ahead. Skanderbeg returned to Krui and then lifted the siege. This victory was well received among the Albanians. Mehmet II was also warlike in nature, 
and he would march against Skanderbeg again. Skanderbeg retreated to the mountains, while Mehmet energetically pursued the attacks against the Albanian strongholds. During the Ottoman incursions, the Albanians suffered a great number of casualties, especially to the civilian population. In January, in the year 1468, all the remaining Albanian noblemen would discuss a new war strategy. During that period, Skanderbeg fell ill and died on the 17th of January in 1468, aged 62. His legacy did not thrive. Within 10 years, Krui had fallen and Albania would remain under Ottoman control until the year 1912, but his legend did. Skanderbeg, the Dragon of Albania, stands as an enduring testament to the power of determination and courage. From his early life as an Ottoman hostage, to his rise as the valiant defender of Albania, Skanderbeg's journey exemplifies the spirit of people yearning for freedom. His legacy continues to be cherished in Albania and serves as a source of inspiration for those striving for independence and justice. The story of Skanderbeg reminds us that one individual, driven by an unyielding spirit, can change the course of history and ignite the flames of liberty in the hearts of many. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe and share, and I'll see you all soon for another History Profile.